Right, hi everyone. Uh, give us give us a minute or two. We'll uh, start with the intros and then we'll get going. Thanks. Well, actually, I can see people already joining. So why don't we get going? So. Welcome everyone to F, uh, FNA's 10th FMI broadcast now. As usual, um, I'll give you a quick intro, a couple of minutes long, and then I'll hand you over to our guests to begin the discussion. So uh, the session will last around 60 minutes, about 45 minutes of that is um, uh, will be spent with our guests, and then we'll have about 15 minutes um, Q&A at the end. So if you want to ask a question, please use the little Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. Don't post it in the chat because it will get lost. So Q&A widget, that's where you post the questions and then hopefully our guests will have time to answer as many of them as we can at the end of the session. Uh, next slide, please. So for those of you um, who perhaps aren't familiar with FNA, uh, maybe this is your first session, I'll explain very quickly what it is that we do. So FNA is an advanced analytics and simulation technology company. So we work across four core sectors, uh, namely central banks, commercial banks, FMIs and national security. Um, and as you can see from the slide, we've worked with a wide range of companies from across those sectors. Next slide, please. Related to this, um, FMIs, challenger FMIs, payment systems, all use our FMI lifecycle solutions to support every phase of their journey. So the bulk of this work is done through the implementation of digital twins, um, building replicas of payment and settlement systems, um, and then activating them with either real historical or synthetic data. And this supports, this enables clients across a number of use cases um, from designing and validating uh, the initial system design, building use cases, business cases for members, right through to monitoring, uh, stress testing, and then optimizing those systems. So we've been lucky enough to work with some superb FMI's payment systems over the years. Some of the work um, can be found on the case studies section of the website, which we'll, we'll post in the chat shortly. So on to our discussion. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Carlos Leon, who works here at FNA as Director of FMI and Digital Currency Solutions. Carlos will introduce our guests and then we'll get the discussion kicked off. So, Carlos, thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, uh, all the attendants. Uh, I'm going to introduce now our guest speakers. David Birch and John Kiff. About David, David is an author, advisor, and commentator on digital financial services. He's an international keynote speaker and recognized thought leader in digital identity and digital money. And we have interacted a lot of times in uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, so on and so forth. And I'm really happy to have you here, uh, David. Thank you for joining. No, thank you. And John Kiff who we already uh, made some accounting and we know it's the third time that John has joined us. And uh, it is really a pleasure to have you here, John. Uh, John is the research director of the Sovereign Official Digital Association, SODA, head of CBDC Digital Capital Markets Advisory at Satoshi Capital Advisors and advisor to Whisper Cash. So John, thank you for joining us for the third time now. Thanks, Carlos. Great to be here. Thank you. So. Uh, Next, um, now what, uh, I'm going to do is a little introduction to what we are going to have today as our subject, which we have called the future of money, the public perspective. So a short summary of, of this topic uh, is that the world is becoming increasingly digital. This is new, this is not new, not at all. When people talk about digital currencies and think that this is new, it is not new, not at all. And but obviously there is a growing interest in how the new digital currencies and CBDCs, for instance, uh, could reshape the financial landscape. These new forms of money have the potential to facilitate faster, cheaper, and more secure transactions. That's what we like to think, while also promoting innovation in payments, financial inclusion, and cross-border payments. So in today's session, we have uh, John, Keith, and David Birch, through their wealth of experience and knowledge, John and David will explore whether or not there is a case for new forms of digital currencies and how they could help address pressing issues in the financial system. What we expect from this conversation is to have a view about how the future of money is being reshaped as we speak and what benefits and drawbacks the public may receive in these new systems. I think that with any doubt, 
the discussion is essential for senior representatives of central commercial banks, central banks, commercial bank regulators, and policymakers who are looking to stay ahead of the curve and help shape the future of money. So that's like my third introductory summary. Once again, David and John, uh, thank you very much for joining us. And I would like to start giving you uh, perhaps one second, five seconds for you to they have any statement that you want to make before we start? Any, you don't belong to any very weird institution as a central bank, but anyway. Uh, I'll sure, start, I'll I'll go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll make a statement. Okay. Um, any references I make to cryptocurrencies are purely for entertainment purposes only, and shouldn't be construed as an inducement to purchase any particular security or class of securities. That's my statement. And my statement's kind of a non-statement since leaving the IMF in 2021. I'm absolutely enjoying the opportunity of not having to give that standard disclaimer at the beginning of every <laughs> every talk that I do. These are you my opinions. Do you know that I come from working 60 years at the central bank? So I, I also had that uh, uh, obligation to make those statements, boring statements, but now I don't. So, so let's start. John David. Uh, just to break the ice a little bit, can you tell us a little bit about what you do related to the uh, retail CBDCs and digital currencies space? Let's start with John. Thanks, Carlos. Um, well, since leaving the IMF um, 2021, I basically continued to do what I was doing at the IMF, but in a more free, free way. Um, so at the IMF, in fact, I, I I was one of the pioneers at the IMF in in following fintech, central bank digital currencies and so on, and, and was part of the teams that wrote several um, influential papers on the topic. And in, in fact, just before I left, we're, the IMF was launching a so-called technical assistance program by which it provides advice to central banks uh, on launching retail CBDC, or not just launching, but thinking about CBDC. That's kind of the expression we like to use. So since leaving the fund, I've basically switched gears and now I provide that that kind of advice to central banks on, on a on a private basis, and in fact, I'm still doing some work on contract on a contractual basis for the IMF, um, advising central banks through through the 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 IMF, uh, and I'm also part of the team that you may have heard. There's a big splashy announcement about a month ago um, about the the IMF launching a, a book, a, a CBDC handbook, essentially, and I'm part of the team at the IMF that's um, writing that book, which is going to be um, revealed in, in chapters over the next uh, couple of years. I think we've got five slated to be um, published between now and the annual um, IMF World Bank meetings in October. That's my story. Good. Thank you, John. David. Uh, well, I'm here because um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book about uh, digital currency <clears throat> which um which is which has actually turned out to be rather prescient so i i had the feeling that digital currency was more important than people were thinking and in particular the sort of competition between central banks and private digital currencies actually and uh, between um between central banks themselves I, I actually had some you know some some interesting implications so so i've always been interested in what digital currency and in particular central bank digital currency means like what's the bigger picture around it um technically my my personal experience advising in this space goes back uh, an awfully long time so as some of the people watching will know i was one of the founders of consult hyperion consult hyperion was the co the company that did the actually they did the original feasibility study for mpesa and they were the advisors to mpesa and we were also the advisors to to mondex so i have I have population scale views on on things that worked and things that didn't work, which I think inform the current digital currency debate quite well. So technically, I go back a long way in it, but right now my interest in the implications of it, um, you know, go back a few years. That's really interesting, Dave. Uh, David. Thank you very much. Tom, now let's go to work. First question is one of those that I always feel that I, when I 
ask some or explains to someone what a retail CBDC or a stable coin is, and they tell, all, always tell me, why do I want that? So this is the first question that we we'll work to, to work on. Are the use cases strong enough to expect digital currencies like retail CBDCs and stable coins uh, adoption? I mean, there are, is there the, the, the strong use case for adoption? And are we ready and eager to use and receive payments in these new, new forms of money? Let's start with you, David. What do you think? Well, I, I would divide the drivers for digital currency into in, for central bank digital currency really into sort of three areas. So there's there's, if you like, the sort of the, the, the political and economic, the social and the technological on the political and economic side. I think the, 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 there is a there is definitely a, a, a new world of competition in currency and um, and actually, central bank digital currencies have a big role to play in that. In fact, actually, I noticed in the press there's been a there's been a flurry of of discussion recently about de-dollarization, and and a lot of it's quite ill-informed because if you look at the figures, of course, um, yes, while the while the while the use of the dollar in international trade and reserves has been going down, it, it actually hasn't gone down that much. And where it has gone down, it's not being replaced by the yuan and the ruble is being replaced by you know swedish crowns and so on but nonetheless there is a political aspect to it if you carry out the thought experiment and say you know if there was for example a, a, a federal reserve digital dollar that anybody in the world could hold in their mobile phone or their smart card or you you do have to ask what the implications of that would be for other currencies because I, I, I would posit, if you look at the experiences on the ground, I mean, if you look at, I mean, I'm sure John's familiar with this example, but, you know, when you go to Bitcoin things, people quite often talk about Venezuela as, um, you know, some kind of use case for why Bitcoin is useful and all this sort of thing. Um, but uh, they talk about it as if it's Narnia, you know, as if it's not a real place that any of us know anything about. You know, it's like this mythical place where people want Bitcoin. Um, but actually, people don't want Bitcoin. They want dollars. If you if you on the streets of Caracas, the shops take Zelle, which is the American domestic uh, account to account payment system, not Bitcoin. So most people in most of the world, most of the time want dollars. So there's the political side of it. The second thing is the sort of is, is the sort of social side of it, the issues around financial inclusion, where I have to say, I don't think central bank digital currency actually makes much difference, but it could certainly spur some innovation, some new thinking around uh, inclusion, as uh, as I'm bored of, uh, actually other people are bored of hearing as well. Inclusion is an identity problem, not a, not a payments problem. So, um, And then there are some other social issues now, which weren't on, the, when I wrote my book, certainly weren't on the agenda around sustainability, which are now central to the agenda. So, so there are these kind of social issues as well. And then thirdly, finally, is the technological, and obviously I come from the technology side, so to me, the technological drivers are the most important ones. And these fall into two categories, essentially. One is the resilience of the infrastructure. I'm, I'm strongly in favor of building an electronic cash system that runs in parallel to the existing electronic money. If, if you put some sort of fiddle about sort of electronic cash on top of the existing system, you actually reduce, I mean, simple mathematics will tell you, you're reducing the overall reliability of the system. But putting an electronic cash system in in parallel with the existing system, I think, adds to the reliability of critical national infrastructure. And finally, and I, I often say to people, you know, if you go back to the Bank of England's original consultations on this topic, the issue of innovation really was very central to the discussion. In other words, or, or, and to put it very crudely, dollar bills don't have an API. If you build digital dollars that do have an API, what will people build on top of those? And that and and the and obviously we want that more kind of permissionless innovation, which has driven some amazing stuff around Bitcoin and Ethereum and things like that. So this this idea that you know if you have something where anybody can just take it and build stuff on top of it, there's no credit involved in it. They can't do any damage with it. Um, that would that would greatly add to the innovation capacity. And who knows who knows what kids in basements will come up with. So, so if if it's okay to sort of frame the argument that way, John, I I, I kind of see the political and economic, the the sort of social and the technological as useful categories for discussing the the pros and cons. 
Yeah, I like that. I like that framework. But uh, I was going to step back from it. And first of all, I mean, reframe that question a little bit, because the question was, you know, are are the use cases strong enough to expect digital currencies um, to be used to receive payments and so on? For, so first of all, I'd say, well, digital currencies aren't that new. I mean, digital currencies are credit cards, debit cards, they're Zelle, they're Venmo, PayPal, they all exist. So the real, I think the question you're really asking is, is, is there a use case for CBDCs and stable coins? And so then, and my, my, you know, my, my views on this have kind of, kind of shifted over time and I've become almost like schizophrenic about my, my views of, of, of CBDC because the, I'm going to start with CBDC first of all. So what's, what's the, what's the use case for CBDC in an economy where you've, you're overloaded with digital currency options? I mean, I'm, I live in the U S I've got access to sell Venmo debit cards, credit cards, when a digital dollar, if a digital dollar is introduced, I'm not going to be very compelled to use it. And that, so that's an advanced economy country with plenty of digital currency options. Then, then maybe we flip to a country where um, there's this financial inclusion problem. And it's related to the fact that uh, you know half the population doesn't even have access to um, to um, connectivity and so on. They may not be packing smartphones. If they're lucky, they might have feature phones. For them. I wonder what the compelling argument is for any kind of digital currency because they're they're disconnected. They're not in the Amazon digital economy. So you introduce digital currency, whether it be a central bank one or not, it's not going to fly very far. And I I can't help but look at the because I'm 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 kind of famous on the on the inter, inter, internet for having a supplying a table where I keep track of every country that's that's looking at uh, CBDC. And there's about I think. Nine of them have launched pilots or full launches, and the uptake. It, I think you have to say it's kind of pathetic. It's it's no one's taken up, and I think, I think that's because there isn't. I don't think that the CBDC launchers and piloters have come have latched on to a, a proper use case, which is kind of why my my think, thought process kind of shifted from focusing on retail CBDC is some kind of replacement or augmentation of the existing digital currency rails, but more of a moving, going to the bottom of the decision tree and looking at use cases that might make some sense. So in fact, I'm involved in some projects that are looking at niche digital currency CBDCs that are meant to service the needs of, of food aid programs and, and, and so on. And so then there's no goal here to put a digital currency in everyone's pocket. So that's kind of where, well, I, think, where Ron, the, the, I mean, I agree with that analysis. I, I think it's it's quite um, uh, who was the guy that did the disruptive innovation thing? Christensen, you know, um, you know, this idea that, you know, you you, you find these niches um, and it makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, designing a digital currency to replace my debit card round at Waitrose is pointless because my debit card round at Waitrose works absolutely perfectly. Well, I mean, why would you launch? an assault on the existing infrastructure in its in its strongest redoubt. I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all. But uh, but there are plenty of places where it doesn't work, and we should probably focus down on those niches. Some of them are things we've talked about before, micropayments and things like that. Some of them are things to do with uh, places where there are rules about using credit and rules about using cards, which are not appropriate. There are things like adult services, for example, where there might be sort of specialist requirements. But I think John's right. I mean, we start with those niches and, and expand out. What I, what I would say about the developed market point, though, John, is it's I have to say it's not transparently obvious to me uh, when we look a little bit downstream, whether people will actually know whether they're using digital currency or not, because we're moving towards this kind of wallet centric view of things. So I, I sort of imagine you know, I, I I go into Walmart, I buy some things, I walk out, something pops up on my phone, which says, okay, you need to pay Walmart $20. Is it? A, I put my thumb on it. Um, and I can see at least three different pathways underneath that, because, you know, you could pull through the existing 8583 rails, the debit or, or whatever. Um, you could do a credit push across Zell through pays or some derivative um, of that, or you could send CBDC, you know, from my wallet to Walmart's wallet. So you could see several ways that, and actually as a consumer, given my sort of fundamental principle that payments are so boring that human beings shouldn't even be in the loop, 
Um, I don't know if anybody would know or care if they were using CBDC. Like we would know because it adds the resilience of the overall system. You know, if the debit network goes down because of a switch failure somewhere or something, the system will use CBDC. If the power's out, uh, you know, every day you read in the papers here some story about, oh, you know, some big supermarket and the power went down so nobody could pay with their cards and it was all chaos. And why these supermarket managers don't have a, uh, you know, a little Bluetooth dongle for these emergencies. I don't know. But but, but you see my point, John, is like I, it, it's not obvious that people in developed markets will know whether they're using it or not, because their their level of interaction is much higher. It's, you know, you need to pay the supermarket. OK. Yeah, on top of that, I mean, I think one of the one of the rationales for introducing the CBDC is often said to be we want to offer this riskless payment instrument. But the, what's interesting is that the is for most people, their payment instrument, their their bank accounts and so on it, are, are well guaranteed in the US FDIC guarantees all deposits up to 250,000. But do people even know about that? Because I think I think it was just this last week, Reuters did a survey or not, gave the results of a survey that said 40% of Americans are very concerned about the the balances in their in their bank accounts. Yet, you know, the FDIC runs a very well oiled uh, machine. They, usually people are made back, they're back in business within within 24 yeah. business hours, right? And so, but you also know that Amer Americans are not, most, a lot of Americans can't rub up two pennies together. I, mean, I saw some, this goes further back, but I think uh, it's like 40% of Americans don't have more than $400 in their bank account. So, you know, the, that 40% of the people that say they, um, that they're worried about the money in their banks, they obviously don't know that they're already sitting on a risk-free payment asset. Yeah, I'm very suspicious about surveys like that, John, because I mean, if you, you know, a survey in the UK or for that matter, Canada or the UK would show that 40 percent of people don't understand anything. I mean, you could ask <laughs> how a photocopy works. And they wouldn't know. So so what are the point of these surveys? I, I don't know. Um, one thing I, one thing I'd add, though, I mean, this is a niche, another niche case in this right here, say in the US and Canada, that's my home country. The um, banks um, charge onerous fees and, and and have a very sometimes quite large a minimum balance requirements to avoid those fees so if you're in that there's a lot of many people in the unbanked sliver or even some of them in the banked and just decided to ante up and pay that penalty um i think cbdc could play a role there too i'm, I'm just thinking like my my son um lives up in canada and so the i think in order to avoid a charge of a dollar 25 per um per, per debit and credit trend, a debit transaction on his on his account, um, he has to either pay up thirteen dollars a month or have a minimum balance of three thousand dollars. Both of those things, when I mean, he opts for the twelve dollars or whatever a month, but that's that's a big chunk of his budget because he's not not financially doing that well right now. So I think there's the, there's a niche case there for that. Um, I don't know how what I wouldn't say. Was, I, actually, I agree with you, John, but I wouldn't say it was a niche because although well, I, I haven't got the figures on the to hand. Although the if you look at the US, for example, the figure, sh I don't remember what the figure shows it, 5% of households are unbanked or something. I don't remember, 7% of households or something like that. Um, but, you know, a quarter of households are underbanked. So in other words, people have bank accounts, but they don't use them because they don't provide any useful services. They just go and draw their money out at the beginning of the month. And um, because anything that the bank provides is either too expensive or too complicated or, or, or you know, not appropriate. So... I, I agree. I'm not I'm not sure I classify it as a niche. I think and actually post Silicon Valley, this argument about whether we should allow narrow banks or payment banks or flow accounts or whatever people call them, that 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 discussion is reignited. And actually, um, that that may well be a, 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 a framing for CBDC, given that there are no fractional reserves. So the idea that you allow but also the other thing is that in the US. I don't know how you think about this, but in, in Europe, we at least have the concept, however accidentally it arose, that you can have institutions, electronic money institutions and payment institutions, that could offer these kinds of accounts without being credit offering banks. And it, in, in the US, I think there was a sort of missed opportunity there with the OCC National Fintech Charter, which was basically just a bank. But, you know, they could have had a sort of national like, or like an Indian payment bank or something like that. There could have been there could have been a sort of national 
narrow bank charter that fintech in fact anybody could apply for ford could do it if they wanted to so so more competition in that space i i i 100 percent agree um i i just i probably just wouldn't call it a niche i think it's stronger than that yeah perhaps think, especially if you we... say if you if you argue that 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 every every citizen has a right to use use a you know a, a cost a virtually costless payment medium which in the old days before digital that's what it was it was people paid with paper money and and it was costless now we've moved into the digital economy and that squeezed out that that costless payment medium so in that sense you know perhaps that's an argument for cbdc on a large scale to say that everyone has a right to basically central bank money well, it, wasn't, it, for... wasn't, it wasn't really costless i mean without sort of diverting the the, the discussion into but but the point is if you if you have a hundred dollar bill in your pocket you, you know the 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 fed sold the, uh, sold that to a bank for whatever it is i don't even know what they sell them for seven cents or something so someone is sitting on a hundred bucks and earning the interest on it and you're not so it, it's not costless and also you you know uh, although we're seeing more of it now someone is paying to drive around trucks full of money and install atms and and all this kind of thing so i, I costless you but know, the I, user, though, I, the, when I when I go into the store and spend money with cash, the, they don't extract a fee for that. If I go to yeah, if I if I if I use a debit, but then yeah, but it's free to me at least from my from my perspective. Maybe the actually, taxpayers pay because yeah. when you go into when you go into a store and pay with the hundred dollar bill, which you don't get charged for, that very handily subsidizes me paying with my American Express platinum card and getting all those air miles so sure. thank you very much for that john because i don't want them to charge me for those air miles i want them to charge poor people who are paying in cash but Why when i pay at amazon policy, when I, when, I have no idea but it is but when, but when i pay at amazon and i'm like my son i'm gonna have to i'm gonna pay a dollar 25 that's gonna i'm gonna see that in my bank statement um at the end of the month i i don't I, so that to me it, it whoever is paying i think the idea that users this you you know Retail users should have access to a to a to what to them is a costless payment medium. Yeah, but it should be. Don't you think that should be a progressive social policy? In other words, <laughs> the rich people should be paying more, not less. True. The, the, it's it's kind of the wrong way around at the moment. The poorest people pay the highest transaction fees. Yeah. Okay, I think that we can. I mean, we have already entered like one of the uh, the topics in the second and third uh, questions. We have to do with the oh, advantages, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the, the disadvantages. Oh, that's fine. I mean, we, I know you. I mean, you and I. We already talked uh, before the uh, broadcast, and we know that we can stand here for four, six hours, perhaps uh, per question, perhaps. Uh, but I'll have to steer it a little bit. So. The next things that we have to talk, I mean, I, I, at the, the view of John about the uh, retail CBDC, for instance, becoming like a niche solution is something that is rather surprising to me right now, because I, I uh, follow John a lot uh, on, on his uh, opinions about the retail CBDC, and now this, this is very intriguing. But uh, jumping to the next, uh, next questions, we already have talked about that uh, retail CBDC or some other types of digital currencies could provide costless or at least less costly uh, ways of paying. We also talked about with David about the redundancy that a retail CBDC could provide to the system, and this would make this system better, more resilient. And also we have talked about offline features, which are obviously something that we have in fact discussed with John in uh, Twitter a couple of times. Uh, what other advantages could we think about retail CBDCs or stable coins that could foster things like financial inclusion or uh, cross-border payments, for instance. I don't know what John thinks about this Cro cross-border. I'm not so sure about. I mean, I see the experiments that are going on in cross-border at the moment, but if you're sort of thinking about population scale transformation, a very small proportion of payments are cross-border. I mean, if if I mean, let's say if if there was a if there's a a, a British digital pound, and you're not allowed to use it outside the UK. I mean, so what? I mean, what proportion of my spending is outside the UK? And I and I'm somebody who travels a lot, you know. And it's like, so I'm, the cross border thing. I'm I have mixed feelings about. You see what's going on with Embridge and these other experiments. Um, 
but the the cost of cross border payments is not really the cost of the payment i mean i don't know what the exact statistic is but i would have thought two thirds four fifths 90 percent of the cost of a cross-border payment is kyc aml ctf PEP. like electrons don't really just cost that much and electrons don't suddenly slow down when they go across the the british border or you know so th these costs are not really much related to the cost of the payment itself so i i I, I could learn more about it and I could certainly be talked out of that view. But my instantaneous view is I'm I'm actually not that focused on cross border. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of in David's camp there too. I I, I know the topic today is retail C B D C, but I think the solutions to any of the any of the frictions other than the KYC, AML, CFT frictions, the the other the more technical ones, I think I think that things like Project Embridge being run by the the IS Innovation Hub has some promise of, I would call this uh, simplifying the spaghetti bowl of of all the connections in the wholesale system we have now. We got correspondent banks and multiple layers of people extracting fees along the way. You're not going to eliminate that KYC part, but I think even there, if you can create some kind of at the wholesale level, some kind of unified unified KYC system, uh, that means that the the the, 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 the everyone can trust that that central KYC. And I think we're getting into David's favorite territory too. It's all about digital ID also. I mean, I think that- It that's, is all about digital ID. It is, it is. And it, it'll weave its way through almost every conversation we have about CBDC. So I'm not a keen fan of the idea of a retail CBDC that's that's gonna be doing cross-border payments. I mean, we do have some instances, I think in East Asia where there's been bilateral arrangements, not CBDC, but um, maybe central bank sponsored payment systems, QR code based systems and so on that do operate across adjacent borders, but it's not a technical issue. These, these are the, the stumbling blocks are usually regulatory and legal. And that's that's why it's not easy to sit to, and we can dream about a world where in my retail CBDC is interoperable with every other, whatever 200 um, retail CBDCs around the world. I think that's, that's, a, that's a pipe dream. I think Enbridge is on the right right track to create some kind of new hub and spoke system using a more efficient rail the wholesale level yeah, i think that the, that the cross-border thing right now at least is more like a wholesale cbdc thing and not so much as a, a, about a retail cbdc right that's that's and i think that many well, central yeah, banks have there, already there said a, that uh, as I say, Carlos, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not saying there isn't a case because obviously, in the very specific case of remittances, we have global targets to reduce the the uh, financial intermediation costs in the remittance sector. Um, if you look at those on a sort of a weighted average, I can't remember what the figure is at the moment, but is it four percent or something like that? And, and and we we still need to get it down, you know, probably to sort of two percent or something like that. But but as John said, you know, if if we want to make a big drop in the cost of remittances, that's going to come through shared and simplified KYC, not not um, not anything to do with the money itself. And, you, fact, and actually, you, you, have an interest, you have an interesting data point uh, not too far from you, because in El Salvador, remember, was it three years ago in El Salvador, they made Bitcoin compulsory. And if you look at the late I saw the March figures. For remittances and the, and the, the, obviously the the El Salvador economy is very heavily dependent on remittances um, and Bitcoin remittances I think I'm right in saying account for 1.3 percent of the total remittance value and that's somewhere where Bitcoin is compulsory so so the idea that CBDC which wouldn't be compulsory of course um, would would suddenly sweep away the costs in this I you know I I don't see it. Yeah. That's true, and and the Salvador case is very interesting for several reasons as well, because it's uh, a good case of how I mean many people complain about retail CBDC being like a surveillance tool for uh, the central bank or the government, but uh, in Salvador case uh, the government is using Bitcoin to do that because they provided the mobile wallet and so forth for the population to use, and they gave a thirty dollar equivalent uh, that is, uh, that is subsidy for people to use it. Yeah, that is a sort of funny kind of thing. I was at, I was at the Payments Canada conference in Toronto, 
last week and and the, one of the dinners there was a sort of interesting discussion around this because I do, I do sort of wonder why people are, they're so upset I and mean, not that the government would necessarily surveil it I mean they would be under certain rules but but the idea that it's bad to have a CBDC that could under some circumstances be be monitored by the government versus Bitcoin which under all circumstances is monitored by everyone um and and somehow that's seen as being more acceptable the fact that you know if I live in Utah and I use Bitcoin to pay for Pornhub I, I assume you can pay for Pornhub with Bitcoin I don't know can you can you Carlos I, I don't know um but assuming you I can don't know. I'm just joking <laughs> but, but, but the point is that why would you want an immutable public record of that? Um, so I think that you know I was arguing with some people this morning about this on on LinkedIn again, which I must stop doing. It's a absolute character flaw. But but I, I don't know if people like Robert Kennedy would be prepared to admit it. But I have a feeling that this whole privacy and anonymity thing is a lot more complicated than seems at first glance. P people are adopting you know very absolute positions on something which is complex and nuanced and i think that that debate has a long way to go well another part of that nuance i think and this is a in actually quite a canadian context of if you're in canada you'll hear you'll you'll always get your ears bent about the trucker protest and how the government basically weaponized bank accounts uh, to shut those truckers down so they're saying now that um, I'm seeing that because yesterday the Bank of Canada announced that they're going to start a consultation on features for a digital loony, as they call it. And 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 uh, right away, I've, I'm seeing across Twitter and LinkedIn, you know, that people bringing up the truckers thing again, saying now they're going to make it even easier for the government to shut payments down. So like you have your little wallet full of digital loonies. And so for some reason, um, you're doing something the government doesn't like you doing, boom, you know, you, you can't spend it. Or are they going to control how you spend it? So you go into, go to, you try to spend your digital dollars in a, you know, at a, in a, a strip club or something like that. Boom. No, you can't do that. You know, so that, that's, that's, a, that's kind of related concern. I think many are more concerned about that, the Robert Kennedys of the world and so on. Um, but at the moment, it's, about that. It, but it's, it's an odd discussion because at the moment it's Visa and MasterCard. That determine those sort of rules, like whether you can buy machine guns or porn or, or whatever, and nobody elected them. So, so as I say, I think that's it's too complex an argument for for social media. Uh, I'm not disagreeing with Robert Kennedy that the government isn't using alien technology from Area 51 through 5G masts to quantum teleport the money out of the wallets of vaccinated people or whatever it was. I may not have followed it in absolute detail but it's something like that but whatever it is it's not suitable for social media discussion it is a very complex topic and very nuanced yeah and i think it maybe goes hand in hand with the idea that you'd be the, the drive is towards eliminating cash which is the way that you know bad potentially bad actors would prefer to operate so in, the, in a cashless society where um you've only got your mastercards and bank accounts and cbdc you know your your last resort for um using to make, do an illicit financial transactions is now gone and of course there's yeah, well going, th that's that's true I'm going to steer the conversation you've got to make a strong case okay. as to why that's bad um you know yeah. the fact that i the fact that you know foreign oligarchs won't be able to send unlimited amounts of secret money to politicians you're going to have to persuade me that it's bad that to, to stop that. And I think we're a long way from that. Also, I think the other thing there is, I'm not sure if people have thought through the consequences. So I, I looked at the Canadian survey, I VPNed in so that I could, I could fill out the survey. And um, which again, illustrates the problem of asking the public, because I don't know the results. And I, don't, I don't know if they're going to publish them, but I guarantee you 90% of Canadians will have ticked the box that says, I want to be completely anonymous. I don't know what any anybody knows. And ninety percent of them will also have ticked the box that says I want loyalty rewards and and points and whatever. So why you would even ask the public about these things, um, you know, is is absolutely not clear. But I think also people don't because people mentally make the huge mistake of comparing digital cash to cash, which is very it's a, it's an apples and oranges. You know, digital cash isn't. Um, an analog of of cash 
digital cash is an entirely new thing for a sort of new age. There's no a priori reason why it has to work like cash. And I think actually the, the danger, you know, a wholly anonymous digital currency would be an absolute catastrophe for our society. It would be an unequivocal catastrophe. And I think, you know, think this kind of this kind of angry white male pseudo libertarian, you know, I should be able to do whatever I want with my cash thing just doesn't stand up to scrutiny in a civilized I, society. I think that flying an airplane with service is rather difficult, right? I mean, that's that's not a good <laughs> plan to to have. Uh, I'm going to steer the conversation somewhere else now. Uh, and it's about what we have heard or read about how the retail CBDCs are doing in some uh, early adopters, let's call it like this, like the Bahamas, Jamaica, Jamaica, Nigeria. We have heard that the adoption and the use is very low and slow. Why is that? And how, could, how to make it right? What do you think about this, David? I think if you're making a sort of, um, if you're taking a sort of global uh, perspective on this kind of thing, I sort of picture things as a bit of a spectrum where the ends don't tell us very much. So there's no point discussing them. So so in this particular spectrum, at one end, you have China, where where the digital currency is an instrument of the state. And if you're Chinese, that that's great. Um, but it might culturally be inappropriate for Canada. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got the US where, you know, it's private and uh, the government shouldn't interfere, and that might work great if you're in the US, but that's culturally inappropriate for most other places as well. So I think if you if you rule out China and the US and say, well, what's going on, generally speaking, apart from that, what you see is correctly labelled as as failure, because in in those circumstances you can't do. Uh, l l l I, I won't name any of the countries. I'm sure John is going to mention them in a moment. I don't want to slight any particular country i would say they all have not thought that you know in a rush to get things out they haven't thought it through properly but i will i will tell you one i don't want to sound like your granddad telling you about this carlos but i will tell you i will tell you one story from ancient history which was the launch of mondex in swindon which was the world's first digital currency um and i can well remember that you could use electronic cash to pay for wedding dresses in the wedding shop which nobody ever did no one ever did but, but you could, they had a terminal and you could pay for a wedding dress with electronic cash. Meanwhile, the places where everyone, by, by which I mean my dad who lived in Swindon, the places where everyone actually wanted to use electronic cash, which were the car parks, you couldn't use it. Only one of the car parks took it. So, so you know, what I took away from that goes back to John's point about niches, which is bringing in digital currency in Nigeria you know, whatever. Bringing in digital currency in certain niches where it's actually useful, that's a different story. And we should focus down on those niches. So the question is, in each of those countries, you know, what are the different niches where it makes sense? A general purpose cash for payment probably isn't the way to go. The, you know, one of the lessons that was learned from those early electronic cash deployments was about branded ubiquity, not geographic ubiquity. So this is why I think some of these country rollouts have problems apart from the fact they've not been thought through properly yeah i think there's another lesson that we can garner from the mondex experience that i think might be playing out in some cases here too and this is kind of a mantra that we 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 say in this in our cbdc advisory work the importance of involving all stakeholders right from the beginning of the design thinking process and in that case in mondex's case one of the flaws was that these these uh, they were offline. Um, it's an offline payment system, but required um, that the, vendor, the merchants have some kind of terminal that that allows these these card based um, digital currencies to work. And no one thought about that problem that you you can have these great little pieces of technology, but they required that you have these vendors that would be and merchants that would have these little terminals and point of sale terminals. And so there's kind of a and then creates a kind of a chicken and egg problem because why would a why would a merchant want to lease or buy one of these devices if nobody's using it? And why and why would you want to and why would you even want to use one of these things when you have nowhere to use it? And Nigeria is kind of an interesting case in point. Um, so I'm naming names here. Sorry. Um, they the, the and there I think there was a lack of 
of engagement with all the stakeholders. In this case, the one they missed out on was the banks. They expected to the banks to be their partner in rolling out the CBDC. And, and, and when it became apparent that it was failing, I mean, the governor gave a speech saying that the banks aren't playing the proper role in all of this. And what's interesting, I was at a workshop where I had a bunch of Nigerian commercial bankers in the audience and I, can, I spun the same story. And then they came up to me and said, and it's not just that we're not playing with this thing. We're actually actively trying to thwart this thing because the, <laughs> the, the central bank expected us without any kind of consultation to be their part, unpaid partners. And then, then we talk about KYC and all that, the onboarding. We're expected to do all the KYC onboarding, et cetera, for absolutely nothing. And we weren't brought in to be consulted on this thing. So I think... I mean, that's another aspect too. I mean, I, I, I think that David's right that, that I think it's better to think about use cases before you think about just rolling out this nuclear retail CBDC. But at the same time, you have to involve all stakeholders. And I mean, that's, that's what's, I guess, charming about the Bank of Canada effort to um, do this consultation and ask all these funny questions. But I mean, that is probably, I mean, that's, that's best practice. You do want to engage with your stakeholders, in this case, users, and hopefully, Bank of Canada is it gets closer to some kind of pilot, pilot and decision that they they do bring in merchants and and um, banks and so on all the people they expect to be part of this new ecosystem and I think that might be a failure there in the case of say the the sand dollar in the Bahamas and so on it it could another thing could be that the, you've already got plenty of digital payment options it's the same thing I talked about earlier I don't I won't be compelled to use the um, digital dollar, and I think they might be facing the same issue there. I mean, Dave was talking about uh, the uh, points and, you know, points you get when you spend with credit cards. I mean, that, that's kind of thing you have to, I think, have have on board. You, you, uh, your CBDC is going into competition against um, credit cards that have all these bells and whistles. But that's, but that's, I, I think, so that, yeah, that's where there could be the opportunity for real, um, and, and I'll use a, I'll use a, you know, first world problems example to, to move away from that, which, you know, I, I happened to be on the British Airways website this morning, booking a ticket on British Airways, which once again, I paid for with my Amex, plat like literally the most expensive conceivable way to pay for it. I used that because thanks to, thanks to the previous government, they're not allowed to surcharge me. So, um, so once again, thank you, poor people for using debit cards to pay for these tickets. Uh, but you could imagine a situation in the future where British Airways said, well, look, you know, if you pay with if you pay with digital cash, you know, we don't we don't want to bother those Amex people. They're so busy with all those transactions and things. Why don't you just send digital cash from your wallet to the British Airways wallet? And by the way, if you do that, we'll give you triple frequent flyer miles, because actually British Airways, I'm guessing I have no inside information, are probably a bit fed up paying money to Amex so that Amex can give me Amex rewards and thus enhance my loyalty to Amex when British Airways would prefer to enhance my loyalty to them. So if the merchants could take CBDC and do their own rewards, um, you know, I think that might be a, a better solution all round for them. So I, I wouldn't. So, so I think rewards could be made to work to support the CBDC. But, but again, I stress, I don't see that as the core to it. The core to it is this innovation platform. You know, Nigeria, I think, is an interesting example. You have a you have a huge population of young, educated, dynamic, entrepreneurial people. So could those people download a piece of software and start building their own e-Naira um, solution? Well, no, it didn't work like that. You know, so if you want to sort of tap into that, which, which are, by the way, if you look at what's happened in India, we you know with UPI and all this sort of thing, you can you can see how you can capture some of that uh, energy and entrepreneurialism. What we should be wanting in places like the UK and Canada and the USA is to make the currency, the digital currency, a that sort of platform for innovation. Like we, we don't have to want to think through all of these use cases ourselves. Oh, I wonder if I wonder yeah. if we can make it attractive to plumbers who are coming to your house and yeah, whatever. Um, why not just make a, you know, take that kind of stripe approach, make a fantastic API, make it attractive for developers to use it, and then just let them let it rip. You know, we don't need to think of all of this stuff. We just need to make it possible for other people to, to make great stuff on top of it. And earlier you mentioned narrow banking and, and so on. And I think there's a possible missed opportunity there too. The, the IMF in particular is very keen on this concept of synthetic CBDC, which is basically a stable coin 
backed by the central bank reserves. And you could, you know, the, 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 I mean, let's face it, almost 99.9% .9 of all stable coins are US dollar based. So that means we're talking about tapping into the Fed and the Fed is fighting that thing furiously, right? They they rejected Custodia's application for a master account because they feared that they might set up a, a narrow bank. And and so I think that that might be that might be a solution to offer up a either either you can do it directly have access directly to um, Federal Reserve master account or the Fed issues a wholesale CBDC that can be used by um, you know used by fintechs and other entrepreneurs. Yeah, I think we the, have US, nine minutes. the US situation right now is, I mean, deep down inside, do they really care that, you know, if, if it turns out all the world's stable coins get based on the dollar? You know, why is that bad for the U.S.? That just increases the U.S. And the, the point about synthetic, by the way, is interesting, John, because as a thorough scholar of monetary history, um, you'll remember it was Keynes who was in favor of Bretton Woods. It was Keynes who was in favor of setting up a synthetic currency. Remember, the bank core was the, yep. the thing. And so but, 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 you know, the U.S. won the argument at that point. But I I, I wouldn't rule that out in the future. The idea that uh, in a in a I mean, I mean, I don't want to sort of shock the audience with with these with these political things but you know in, in a future multipolar world um it might turn out that uh, something like the bank or um might be a better solution because it because obviously the dollar would have a heavy weight inside that um rather than esdr sort of, right hmm? esdr is, is something that comes up frequently yeah in i mean you, you know this i i did think at the time of libra you know, which is, you know, why why don't you just do a deal with the IMF instead of pretending that the existing monetary system doesn't exist? Why don't you do a deal with the IMF and just issue an electronic SDR and and have done with it? You know, so I think that's not crazy, actually. It might come back in the future. I should be careful of that one, because actually right now I'm talking to you from inside the IMF. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, just mum's the word. OK, just keep the okay, deal. Okay. Not until we've patented it. Once we've patented <laughs> it, then you, then you can go tell them. We have. Eight minutes left. Oh, so sorry. let me draw my last. Uh, that's fine. I mean, I love I love this kind of conversation. Uh, it makes my job a lot easier. Uh, let's discuss two things. First one, it, this is like a perspective exercise. How do you see cash, retail, CBDC, and stable coins in the retail payment ecosystem in say five years? Oh, sorry, I forgot we were supposed to be looking at the Q and A channel. My my apologies. I forgot we were supposed to be looking at the questions. I'm sorry, Carlos. I've got it open now. Um, no, no, no. The Q okay, the Q and A. We're going. I'm going to to select one or two after you uh, after we answer this question. Oh, okay. okay. This perspective of in five years, what what do you think we'll be seeing about brittle CBDC stable coins and so on and so forth? Well, that's a thorny one, isn't it? Because yeah. I think we're we're still evolving the products themselves. So we, you know, if, if we, we if CBDC develops along the lines of being effectively like a stable coin and stable coins, let's face it, stable coins as they exist today are running on permissionless public chains, right? And and you know, can throw KYC and AML CFT out the window with those products, at least as they exist today. So if in that case, I I can see that uh, you know maybe stable coins remain. In the metaverse and the Web three world, and that which is where they they basically are focused right now, or or, in, or as a or as the reserve currency of the crypto exchanges, and then CBDC maybe becomes a niche kind of product um, in in different countries, perhaps. I mean, I don't think cash is going to go because that's so politically such a political hot potato, and it's also the ultimate backup. I mean, I'm a big keener on offline CBDC as a backup plan, but what do you do when everything's all the power's out and everything? I'm, I always like to bring up the Carrington event, which is something that happened back in the 1800s, where it was a solar flare that knocked out all of, all of the, the telegraph systems. It blew up, blew out uh, generators. In that kind of world, you know, we could be months or years without adequate power and so on. So you need cash as a backup there. Well, if you, I would say in modern Canada, in the U.S., if you're going to be months without power, you don't need cash. You need you know, antibiotics and bullets, basically. I mean, cash, <laughs> cash is not going to help you. Yeah, right. That sounds like the last of us of HBO, <laughs> right? So let's go with the some of the questions from the uh, from the pen. Uh, we have one, which is what will happen with traditional banking services, such as loans, mortgages, and savings accounts 
when retail CBDCs or stable coins are become perhaps uh, massively used. Is there any change for this? That's kind of a design question, isn't it? Because I mean, that's the thing. That's something that central bankers wring their hands about when they think about CBDC. Is that they call it disintermediation, and that basically is the result of making a CBDC too attractive, particular, particularly in a store of value sense. So you know, you'll hear economists talk about all the wonderful things that you could do with an interest-bearing CBDC. So you can imagine that uh, such a CBDC, if the interest rate were high enough, would start drawing funds out of the commercial banks and so on, and would have an impact on their provision of loans and financial services and so on. So, you know, I think that's a potential scenario, but I, you can see so far that all the pilots and launches are unremunerated, so there's no interest on them at all. And I think most central banks, when they think about a CBDC, are thinking it as a payment medium only. And then, so it would be, a, they would, they would think it would, they would be an error if they created a CBDC that was actually importantly um, undermining the um, conventional financial sector. I mean, I think certainly in the detailed study work I've seen inside central banks about this, I think the I think the um, the dangers are currently sort of overstated. Uh, and I think actually a rather interesting use case of that, um, not use case, a rather interesting data point is Germany, because I remember doing some work a couple of years ago about the crossover point because the, the interest rates were negative. And so the question was, how negative do the interest rates have to go before people will draw their money out and hold it in cash instead? And I, th and I think without going into the ins and outs of the details, that it turns out the answer is very. You know, the interest rates can go very negative before it's worth people the hassle of, of storing the cash under their mattresses or at home. So, so how much, you know, if I could store all of my wealth on a USB stick, I still wouldn't do it because I want my wealth stored in, you know, uh, bonds and stocks and commodities and whatever. Actually, which, an interesting point about stable coins, John, I think one, in, in terms of the scenario planning around this, I, cer I certainly think one viable scenario is where, is where stable coins as we currently, I mean, not, not in the original sense of algorithmically maintained stable coins, but stable coins as in fiat stable coins, are replaced by digital dollars, digital pounds, digital euros, and so on. But actually, stable coins that are gold, oil, you know, other things like that, I, I think they do have something of a future because they make it easier for people to hold and trade those underlying commodities. You know, for me, for me to for me to store some gold or have some gold stored in a depository for me. I mean, you can do it, of course, but for the average investor, I don't know. Whereas holding some gold tokens in my custodial token account at Barclays, that's not crazy. And there's there's all sorts of reasons why I might want to put electricity into my pension fund or oil or something. So, so maybe there's another future for stable coins, which is not fiat currencies, but but other other assets. Well, let's take a look at Zimbabwe, right? They've just this week they launched a gold-backed coin. So this is not even a stable coin. It's yeah, a, this is a, it's arguably a central bank digital currency that's gold-backed and gold-pegged. It'll be interesting and to see how the, that goes. Well, I'm, and, and with the historical reputation for probity that goes behind those tokens, I, I certainly will be first in the queue to try and buy one. And yesterday I, I read that Texas, there there is someone in Texas who, who like passed a proposal to have like a digital currency backed by dollar, by gold to be issued by the government of texas i would say or the i don't know how to uh, well you know the uh, issue it but the the gold people never go away so um and actually i you know i i could easily you could have a you know a global you know not islamic non-interest bearing gold currency that be that might be very attractive to a lot of people so no, I think I don't see anything wrong with gold stable coins. I, I'm perfectly reasonable. John, David, I have to stop here. It's I have to go to the other call. So. Point of the hour. So thank you very much, David and John, for joining us. It has been a very vivid uh, discussion about uh, digital currencies, retail CBDC, even wholesale CBDC. So I'm really thankful for for your participation, for your contribution today. So if you want from the attendees to get in touch with uh, David or John, 
uh, we're going to distribute the, the, uh, the links to LinkedIn or to contact them. So once again, thank you for joining us. And coming up next in the new, in the uh, forthcoming uh, sessions of the FMI broadcast, we'll have the BIS, uh, G plus D Bank of England and the National Bank of uh, Austria. So John, once again, David already left. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'll see you in the in next opportunity. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. That was fun.